Hello and welcome back to part two of my analysis on the Flare 30 accident uh, that happened oh, 30 some odd years ago now. Um, I hope you watched the first part. If you haven't, please do so uh, because what I'm about to say here will make no sense uh, without having watched that first part. Just to give you an idea of who's doing the work and why I'm qualified to do it. Um, I have a background in aero engineering. Uh, I have a master's degree in the subject from the University of Illinois. I've been a pilot for more than 50 years. I learned to fly before I learned to drive. I've flown every type of aircraft except for maybe like a gyrocopter and a jet. Uh, I have many hours on hang gliders and paragliders and single engine and sailplanes, which is where I started my flying career. I'm the designer of dozens of aircraft. And I say dozens because I include all the model aircraft. Uh, because they're just as hard to design as a full-size one. Involves all of the same physics. Um, I've been involved in the design of several record-setting aircraft. So uh, I've been steeped in aviation and engineering most of my life. Um, I'm currently retired, but I've spent 30 some odd years working in the aerospace industry here in the United States. And uh, I'm, as you know, I'm working on a new design called the Klingberg Wing Mark II and I've run into some interesting aerodynamic phenomena on that project and all of a sudden I realized, oh, it might be connected in with what happened with the Flare 30 and let's go take a look at that and see if we can learn something. And in the process of learning, I want to share with all you folks out there, because somewhere out there, there might be some designers working on new flying wing designs and they should have this information uh, because it will keep them from getting into trouble, hopefully. Um, Anyway, so all of that said, this is a very brief episode here uh, to tell you where I'm headed and what I've been doing recently. So I attempted to find the airfoil coordinates for the aircraft, uh, which seemed to be unavailable. Uh, so the best I could do was take the suggestion from my viewers to go to Nichols' book on flying wings, and in there is a sketch of the airfoil. How accurate it is, I don't know but it's the only thing we really have. Uh, so what I've done is I've uh, used that sketch from the book and done some manipulation on it to get the airfoil coordinates out of that sketch. And I'm using those coordinates in a program called uh, XFOIL, uh, XFLR5. And it's a uh, lifting line theory, uh, mesh theory uh, analysis program. Computational fluid dynamics is what it does. Um, and I'm using that to build a model uh, in the program of the Flare 30 using that airfoil. And as I started that analysis, I quickly discovered uh, that there are things that were occurring on that aircraft that people are probably unaware of uh, unless they had that analysis tool and ran through it, and that the causes of the crash are much more complex than anticipated. So there, there are multiple causes of the crash, as there usually are in these situations, and they interacted with each other in such a way as to result in disaster. Uh, and kind of unpredictable, because they flew for 50 hours before the crash happened. And the question in my mind on the first episode was, how do you fly for 50 hours and then fall out of the sky? Well, you have multiple factors where uh, if one happens, you're still fine. If the, something else happens, you're still fine. You combine one or two or three factors together in just the right way, and you fall out of the sky. Uh, and that's where it gets tricky. And took everybody by surprise, of course. So uh, the analysis that I'm doing is going to take some time, because I have to run through a lot of permutations of different configurations to find out what is it that finally trips you over the line and you crash. So that we can, as we go forward with future flying wing designs, we can avoid that line. Uh, there's a lot of missing data. I have looked and talked to people who might have the data. I've spoken with uh, over the internet with people in Germany that know certain people that are connected, and nobody's really talking. Nobody wants to seem to release the real hard data that I need to do a super accurate analysis. So I'm doing an analysis that is I hope close enough. And because this data is missing, it involves a lot of uh, what we here in the United States call SWAGs, uh, which stands for Scientific Wild Ass Guess. 
Uh, it's better than just a plain wild ass guess because it's scientific, uh, but it's the best we have. In other words, I have to apply my engineering knowledge and my experience flying to make an assumption that's probably in the ballpark of reality, uh, but it could still be wrong. Um, what really appears to have happened was that the designers of the Player 30 ran into what I call a design trap, something that you don't know that it's there, it's hidden, and you accidentally step in it, and boom, you're done. Uh, so it's really nobody's fault. Uh, flying Knowledge of flying wings on a heavy-duty engineering point of view is largely unknown. There haven't been that many of them designed over the years. Dozens as opposed to thousands of other aircraft. Uh, it's a largely unexplored region of flying and aerodynamics, and there's still a lot to learn. It's been a hundred years approximately since the first flying wing, and we still don't know that much about them. Uh, but in the 30 some odd years that have passed since the flare crashed, we've learned a lot. Uh, and we can apply those lessons learned to this analysis. So really, nobody at fault, just one of those design traps. It's why this type of work is risky. You don't know they're out there. Number four, as I read the initial crash analysis report, I realized, oh my goodness, there's human factors involved here, and they may have played a key role, which can happen uh, in this field of endeavor. Uh, there are a lot of passions that get involved with various aircraft designs and people are convinced of one thing that it's true and somebody else does some analysis and says no it's not true and they say your analysis is wrong, round and round you go. Um, and because people are so passionate about it and get emotionally connected to their ideas and concepts, it can lead them down dangerous paths. Uh, people like to think that this is a hard engineering uh, approach and it's truth and fiction and I'm going to do what's true and have a successful design and for most cases nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, human beings are involved and they make decisions emotionally and that appears to have happened here and it probably played a role in what caused the crash. Um, so I am providing today uh, a copy of that initial crash report, which was done in German, translated to English in the copy that I have very poorly, uh, and I've retyped it, not into real English, but using my engineering background to interpret what they're saying there and make some comments that might be useful. I'm making that report available on my Patreon site to everybody for free. Uh, there's a link in the description below. You can click on that link. It'll take you into my Patreon site and there will be public access to that report. In addition, there will be uh, the set of coordinates for the airfoil. Keep in mind, that's not the exact airfoil that was on that aircraft, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood. It's in the ballpark, and it's sufficient for doing at least a preliminary analysis. Um, and then there will be some of my comments about that report, uh, both on the Patreon site and within the report itself. And until then, as I say to all my viewers, please fly safe and bye for now.